Well, now we're getting down to the final stretches. As you can see, uh, the synthetic aperture radar lecture is quite a long one. When I, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, but when I first started putting together the lecture, I thought it'd be only 60 view graphs long. But the whole technique is so rich, and it, it's so much has been developed that the, the, the briefing, uh, excuse me, the lecture actually doubled in size. Now, now let's move on to it. I, I want to show you a few of the, of the many different image formation techniques uh, that, are, that have been developed. And this is to point out that there's, uh, this is very fertile ground for people to take SAR data that's very accurate and make it even better with uh, the, the, the algorithm development. And I'm going to show you three different areas where uh, techniques have been developed that are quite interesting and they're all different. Um, there's a table in uh, Mark Russell's uh, introductory text. He has a good section. I'm going to go over the references for SAR in quite detail later. But he has a section in there where he has one whole page of, of from the basic SAR uh, image formation, pulse processing, image formation, and advanced techniques, and the many different, uh, how to deal with motion. And he goes through all of these different, uh, and he references them. So you'll be able to, when you go to that, you'll be able to see. So uh, in this uh, uh, fifth part, we're going to talk about advanced image formation techniques, just three of them. Okay. And the first we're going to look at is interferometric SAR. We call it INSAR. And an interferometric synthetic aperture radar, it uses two synthetic aperture radar images. And they're taken at slightly different altitudes. And, and what you do is you coherently compared these two at different altitudes are compared to get high resolution information resulting in the measurement of the height of the terrain. So you can get the height of the terrain by at two altitudes taking a measurement. And in the examples uh, later on I'm going to show you a couple of different ones but I'm going to only focus on one. A second thing you could do is either have the aircraft or satellite make one pass or two systems. You can do this by having it make one pass with two antennas at different altitude or one system making two passes over the same terrain. And the phase ambu ambiguity problem has to be dealt with to obtain absolute height measurements. Now with the one pass in the INSAR, it's more expensive because you have two antennas, receivers, and A to D converters. You simultaneously collect the data and you processing on the platform is feasible. And the NASA's S RTM project, which uh, you, you can look that up in reference 10. Uh, that's where the uh, synthetic aperture radar that's on the shuttle, uh, a, a, a couple of antennas were added to it at a different height, and that was used to measure height data as the shuttle viewed the Earth with a synthetic aperture radar. We're going to see some nice pretty pictures of that later. But next we'll go to the two-pass system. There's no special hardware. You just fly the SAR twice over the same terrain. It's a difficult motion compensation problem, so you're going to have technology issues with your IMUs. You've got to deal with them, get them fine enough. And you need excellent vertical resolution you're going to have because of the long baseline. That's a difficult problem. And an example is the Magellan mapping of Venus. And I'm going to focus on those. Now, rather than going through the derivation of this, which is probably for each one, two or three view graphs, um, Roger Sullivan, in his text, and I'll comment and give Roger more kudos, in reference three or four, uh, and I'll say why there are two different ones, he has detailed uh, derivations of these two approaches. We're essentially geometric. You look at the geometry and say, oh, yeah, you can figure it out the height from the two different passes. But anyway, I want to point out that the details of how this is done um, 
are in Roger's book in detail and in just a few pages, but in, in the interest of keeping this manageable, this lecture, uh, in terms of uh, the, the formalism, and because I really want to show you a lot of the fantastic images that have come out of SARS, and there's a good section in the, the at the last uh, part that has that. Um, uh, so now let's look at one specific example of an in interferometric SAR two-pass system. Here we have a nice big picture of the Magellan missions uh, spacecraft before it launched. Here, and here we see the antenna, and this is an altimeter antenna, and here we see the altimeter has a footprint on the ground. So we want, because we want to know the height from the satellite to the ground accurately, and here's the, the image swath, and here are the detailed parameters. For the first time, I think I've shown them, it's 2.4 gigahertz, uh, a little, little uh, lower in frequency than a typical S-band. And it's got 325 watts of peak power, not all that much. The antenna diameter is 3.7 uh, meters. And the pulse length is uh, 26 microseconds. And it's got a PRF between 4,400 and 5,800 hertz, variable depending upon the different parameters. And it it, it, when it mapped Venus, its range and cross-range resolution was 150 meters. So Venus, this planet, which we see in a false color image of what the actual terrain looks like, if you look at it with uh, the Hubble telescope, all you'll see is a big gas. You will see none of this imagery. So this is what the, the incredible contribution that the Magellan mission made in being able to map the ground in Venus. And of course, since uh, Venus is, uh, you know, in the order of thousands of kilometers across, you know, it's th this is a very coarse, crude picture of Venus. But the actual map made is good to plus or minus 150 meters. And in this next view graph, I believe it is, we'll show you just how good that is. Now, uh, the, the Magellan SAR data was used with the radar altimetry data to help the, the SAR, you know, get a 3D map of the surface. And this is Mart Mons. It's an 8 kilometer high volcano. And it is a, named for the Egyptian goddess of truth and justice. And you can see lava flows extend for hundreds of kilometers to the base of the volcano. And the viewpoint is 560 kilometers north of the volcano at an elevation of 1.7 kilometers. Now we've ex exaggerated the vertical scale uh, 22 and a half times so you could see it well. And the simulated color and a digital elevation map were used to enhance the small scale structure. And the color hues were based on images recorded by the Soviet uh, Venera 13 and 14 spacecraft. But isn't that a fantastic image uh, of an eight kilometer high volcano? Okay, now let's switch to a completely different technology foliage penetration radars with synthetic aperture technology. High-frequency microwaves don't penetrate foliage. And UHF and VHF have been used to penetrate foliage since the late 1960s. Uh, some of them were developed to see through the triple canopy in Vietnam uh, down to the ground. And the, the, all the vegetation at UHF and VHF is like a, a lossy dielectric. And uh, you, that's how you can model it. The large fractional bandwidth requirements that you need and the long integration times for, for the motion compensation, those requirements, for successful SAR operation, there's significant technical challenges, particularly in the antenna design. And I'm going to show you they've been met. And in addition to the wide real aperture beam, uh, it's an issue that requires the uh, use of range migration algorithms. 
And notwithstanding all that, those challenges, a number of authors have put out really good papers so uh, detecting vehicles under trees. And there actually is one out in the open literature with a UHF Fopen SAR. And here it is. And here's a photograph, a visual photograph, depression angle 45 degrees, taken with a UHF SAR, airborne SAR. And here we see trucks. And here we see that trail. And there and there, out of the foliage, we see two of the trucks out here. But down in the foliage, when the trucks are shielded, you can't see them. And that's taken at 35 gigahertz. And, but when used with a UHF, the foliage penetration SAR, you can see the whole track there, there, and there, there, and there. Uh, the whole train of, of the vehicles can be seen quite well on the road with the foliage penetration star. So you see, here's another way where really smart, bright, bright people using synthetic aperture techniques to do something else. Before we saw it actually mapping a planet that hitherto you know, really, it's a, a map of the planet had never been mapped. Okay, and here we see, uh, this points out, these three trucks right here are hidden by the foliage, and we see the three trucks here in the UHF radar. Neato, huh? Now, we're going to talk about an algorithm, and... The first thing I want to say is to describe, many of you may not be familiar with modern spectrum estimation techniques, so-called super resolution. And it can be applied to multi-dimensional dimensional data to get sort of better than resolution than one might expect you could get. And the benefits of this, of course, are you get better resolution, side lobe and speckle reduction, feature enhancement. It's sort of like you like your cake and eat it, too. And the goal, of course, is automatic target recognition for the military and to exploit the quality of data in limited imagery, uh, whether that's remote sensing or military data. Now, Jerry Bennett is an expert. In fact, he developed the high-definition high vector imaging uh, super-resolution techniques. And you can look at his, there was an article in the Lincoln Lab Journal, which I'll point out specifically when we look at the references in a few moments. Uh, well, in, in, at the end of the talk. And in reference eight, uh, Jerry has a, a paper in that journal. And if you just said Bennett's uh, vector imaging, MIT, and you put it in Google or Google Scholar, it'll point to it and just boom, you'll get the PDF of his paper, which is probably 20 pages long. And the three view graphs that I'm going to show you of results. Uh, uh, are there along with the formalism uh, which you probably need to be re reasonably cognizant about spectral estimation techniques to understand how he applied spectral estimation techniques to SAR imagery to significantly improve the performance. And I'm going to show you uh, visually those performance and improvements. And, and image uh, con reconstruction, first let's take uh, a comparison of three different kinds of uh, processing. We have two-point scatterers with high signal-to-noise ratio and 60 dB of dynamic range, and they're pretty close together. And if we just do a Fourier transform, a 2D FFT, we're going to have relatively high side lobes. And if we apply weighting to the Fourier transform, we'll get what we expect from rating. Conventional weighting like a cosine or whatever, you'll get a broader beam and lower side lobes. You won't get those old 13 dB near side lobes there. You'll get them lower. But it's harder to tell them apart. And then you have your magic. When you, when you process the data through a high definition, Jerry Bennett's, and, uh, which he developed at Lincoln Laboratory, the high definition vector imaging, which is described in that Lincoln Lab Journal article in great detail if anyone wants to use it. Look what you see. Not bad. Okay. Now let's say what you want to do is you want to get rid of interference. 
And uh, as you'll see, uh, the interference could be a jammer. And the, we, I, here what we have in light are high amplitude, and we see nulls in, in, in dark, uh, range, cross-range pattern. So we have range and cross-range. Now, it, the circles are where the jammers are in range and cross-range. And the, one of them's even right in the resolution cell, just about for, for uh, regular Fourier transform 2D processing. And uh, these are the jammers of the interference. And right here is the focus, the point we want to maximize. And if we wait, we see we get the nulls out wider. But we didn't, we, we diminished somewhat this interferent interferer but this one's still in the beam but with high definition vector imaging the nulls can be moved around so that nulls appear where the jammers are in range cross range space for a synthetic aperture radar so you can see there's real benefit to that okay Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to take a break, and then I'm going to show you some SAR examples from a number of Sandia National Laboratory. Uh, excuse me, Sandia, for not making your L a capital L, and from MIT Lincoln Laboratory to show you what uh, these radars can do in terms of resolution. And uh, we'll talk about that in detail in the next piece.